Like ultimately we don't know how one another's brains work. We don't know what's going to be upsetting for one another. I could, you know, I could name a, an NPC in a game Catherine and not realize that like your mom's name was Catherine and she died last week, right? Like it's not even like big triggering, uh, like terrible problematic things. It can be just like things that we don't know will catch someone else off guard. And just like having, having the tools and the social contract to just like prioritize everyone having fun um, is so important. And that's like, that's something that I've seen develop in the community over the last 10 years. And it's something that was like a different expectation standard between the first and second edition of Monster Hearts. Monster Hearts. It's one of the first Powered by the Apocalypse games ever released, yet it's still one of the most popular. Now couple that with the innovated and lauded The Quiet Year, and you begin to see why Avery Alder's name is part of any conversation around the indie RPG scene. Avery and I discuss her games, her creative approach, and her most recent work. Stick around until the end when we get her insights on the rapid growth of the role-playing industry. This episode and all the content coming from the third floor are only possible because of the generosity of our patrons. A quick shout out to some of our most recent patrons. Kevin Radicamere, Philip Cummings, Jonathan Kennedy, Freed, Farty McButterpants, and Johan Hofflin. Because of you and the 100 plus other patrons out there, we're able to bring you content on a weekly basis. All right, sit back, relax, and enjoy my time with Avery. Do you love to unplug and play games around the table? Greetings, friends and floorheads to Tabletop Talk from Third Floor Wars. If you love tabletop gaming, you are in the right place. Listen as Craig delivers in-depth discussions and interviews with game designers, creators, insiders, and experts. Learn from the people making and playing the role-playing, miniature, and board games you love. Now, enjoy the show. Howdy, friends. Craig here. Today, we're talking to Avery Alder. Avery is best known for the role-playing games Monster Hearts, The Quiet Years, and Dream Askew. The tagline on her website, Buried Without Ceremony, is Games That Mean Something. It describes her work as games about community, relationships, doubt, queerness, and the collapse of civilization. Avery, welcome to the third floor. Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me on today. So I've really been looking forward to this because, um, as my listeners know, and you may not, is I took about a 20, 25 year uh, break from role playing games. And uh, when COVID hit, I came back. Um, and needless to say, the landscape of role playing has changed quite a bit in the last 20, 25 years. And uh, there was a few games that constantly came up in conversations as I was talking about, you know, what had happened um, to games over that time. And your work consistently came up. Um, so I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I've actually I've been doing game design since about 2005 or 2006. So I've gotten to witness quite a few of those transformations as well over that time. It's been really exciting and interesting. I can't wait to talk about it. But first, we need to figure out how you found gaming. So uh, at one point in your life, Avery, you didn't know you could roll dice, pretend to be other people and uh, kind of participate in the hobby. So I'm wondering if we can go back in time to really your first exposure uh, to tabletop gaming. Yeah, um, well, it's interesting because from a very young age, like I think around when I was seven or eight or something like that, I have notebooks where I would just like be writing out spell lists or like designing <laughs> back covers of the video games I would theoretically one day design. And so my first like orientation towards games was, oh, yeah, I'll just start making those, even if I don't <laughs> totally understand what they are yet. Um, but my, my first exposure to role playing games was largely I grew up in a, a really small rural town and we had one interesting store downtown and it was Lester's Hobbies. And they had magic cards and Dungeons and Dragons and remote control airplanes. And like, I didn't totally understand these things because they didn't actually have the money to buy three hardcover books. But I could look at the covers through the glass and imagine what they were. Um, mm -hmm. So I spent a long time anticipating the day that I would one day play these shiny games on the other side of the glass. Um, 
And when I started playing uh, role playing games, it was D and D three point five, um, and it was in high school with my friends. We were about fifteen, and um, so the thing about fifteen year olds is they they really are convinced that they know everything, right? <laughs> I, we, we get a lot dumber as we get older, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we get a bit more perspective. One of the two. Um, yeah, one of the two. But we we all came in with different visions of what Dungeons & Dragons was in our heads. And I feel like Dungeons & Dragons really uh, intentionally creates that set of yeah. mixed expectations for players, right? It, it promises to be everything for everyone. And so we all came in with different expectations. Um, and one of us would take a turn being the dungeon master. And then by the end of the session, everyone else would be like, this is totally not how D&D is supposed to be. <laughs> this is garbage. You don't understand the rules. Um, you know, one person would be like, great, you are in Fantasy Village. There is items shop, potion shop, and druid circle. Don't go in the druid circle. Uh-oh. There's a level 19 guy who's going to kick your ass. <laughs> and so at the end of that, we'd be like, this is junk. Uh, and then someone else would take over and we'd go on this fantasy adventure. But in the end, like, doo do it was all a dream. And we're all oh pissed off goodness. because it was all a dream. And then I take a turn and I'm like, great. So you are all enslaved gnomes and minotaurs. And this is about like the revolution. And they were like, this is not what d d is supposed to be either. So we, we kept on like... <laughs> tearing one another down and arguing about what the game was supposed to be, which got me looking for games that brought more of that clarity to the table. Right. I discovered a design forum online called The Forge, which proved to be really influential for me and the generation of designers that I uh, worked alongside emerging in my career. And I discovered a game in particular called My Life with Master um, by Paul Sega. And my life with Master is about it's like it is it is the exact opposite of the problem we were having with D and D. It is like you you can't be anything and anyone you want. You are specifically like a feeble henchman to an evil villain in a Central European Gothic village. Wow. You live just on the outside of the village. You have one or two like strained potential relationships with villagers. It is about 1847, give or take maybe five years at most. It's like it's very constrained. It's Um, Tuesday and it's sunny outside. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's stormy. Um, It's definitely stormy (laughs) outside. Um, But in this game, you have two stats. Um, You build relationships. There's a specific end game you mechanically trigger at some point um, where eventually these henchmen they develop relationships with the community members. There's a redemption arc. They learn to love themselves, and eventually they overthrow and attempt to kill their master. Um, That's fascinating. Fasc- and, and to your point, the direct opposite of your initial experience with uh, Dungeons & Dragons. Yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of mind-blowing because it was, it was very yeah. much like, here's your aesthetic. Here's your plot arc. Here's your pacing. And there's a lot of room to tell interesting stories there. But those constraints really created... Um, like a, a creative pressure cooker that might not have been expected. And so that approach to game design really inspired me to try and create things that were like games that tell specific stories. Um, and so that's how I got my start. It's, it's fascinating to me, Avery, because that is one of the things that I talk about a lot on the show is that was a huge shift. Um, because if you go back to, you know, the early nineties when I, you know, finished up role playing, um, and took a break, you know, everything was pushing towards generic, right? Generic systems, things like GURPS, champions, um, uh, you know, the hero system, things like that. And when I came back, I came back expecting one thing, which was a continuation of the progress because, you know, it's all about me. And I assumed that the role playing games all paused until I came back um, and they didn't. And one of the things that shocked me was how specific games had gotten. And my initial reaction to it was, you know, this isn't what, what's going on here. You know, the, the, you, you, you don't tell me what how to play my games. Don't you know. And then I started playing the games. And I was like, holy cow, like, this is amazing to have a system that is so specific. Um, When you think back to your first exposure to that, did you have any initial resistance or did you just fully accept the concept of these constraints? You know, I think because I had those experiences of D&D where like we actually couldn't play the game because we disagreed about what the game was, that when I hit those constraints, it was like a breath of fresh air. It's like, finally, someone's telling me what to do. Uh, right. Which is like a really funny kind of oxymoronic thing, but it is. 
but the more I've played a variety of games, the more I've uh, fully appreciated, like, I already have permission to tell stories about anything I want. That is already a thing as a human being I can do and every other human right. being can do. Um, that's not the hard part, right? The hard part is having um, structure and constraints and meaningful choices that a lot that challenge us to create stories we couldn't have told otherwise stories that wouldn't have come to us if we were just sitting around a campfire trying to tell our best story right and so that's i think what makes role-playing games great is they push you into situations where you tell a story you couldn't have told otherwise Oh, very, very fascinating. So, guys, today I want to kind of pick Avery's brain a little bit and learn about uh, how she approaches and how she makes her games. Um, I'll get a sense of what drives her creativity. And it sounds like based off of the conversation we just had, it started very early. And I'd be curious to know what her process entails. Um, so let's find out what inspired her to make some of the games that she's put out. We'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. DZ Learguard here, creator of the M3E Crew Builder app, and I'm a patron of Third Floor Wars because supporting great content creators like them is one of the best ways to help grow this game. So to join me and the other floor heads, go to patreon.com and search for Third Floor Wars, and we will see you there. Right now is the part of many podcasts where someone comes on, interrupts the show, and explains that you should consider paying for the content you're already getting for free. They'll go on and explain that by giving a dollar or more a month, you not only support the show, but you allow the show to grow and improve. Here on the third floor, we commit to not interrupting your episode of Tabletop Talk with such a plea. We pledge not to run a spot asking you to go to patreon.com and give a dollar or more a month. Even if there's a link in this show's description, and there is, we won't ask you to click it and become a patron. We won't spend time yammering about the benefits like early access to episodes, getting those episodes without ad breaks, or even getting a chance to play in one of Craig's RPG sessions. Anyway, enjoy this episode. We needed to clarify that we wouldn't do this type of solicitation. So I mentioned, um, Avery, you know, uh, coming back to role playing and discovering it and, and Monster Hearts was probably the work of yours that um, I heard in the conversations the most. So um, I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, it came out in uh, 2012, but I would imagine the initial um, work on that was well before that. So can you give me an idea really where if we were to forensically go back and discover the beginning of Monster Hearts, where that might be? Yeah. Um, so Monster Hearts is a game about teenagers who are dealing with all the upside downness of high school and simultaneously all the upside downness of secretly being a monster. And that monstrosity um, is both literal, like you do turn into a werewolf and eat your classmates and it's a problem, but also yeah. it's a metaphor for all the different ways that teenagers are kind of growing unevenly and dealing with dysfunctional personality traits and seeing if they become their best or worst selves in the pressure cooker of high school. And um, I guess there's two places that it came from. Mechanically, it borrows a lot of the system and the, the game engine of Apocalypse World. Mm -hmm. um, Apocalypse World was by uh, Vincent and McGay Baker. It came out in 2010, I believe. Um, and it was really influential. I think it continues to be influential to this day. Yeah. Um, you are a group of badasses in community in the apocalypse, trying to figure out how to navigate that world. Um, but one of the cool things is that the bakers were really encouraging of people to play around with that system. You know, it was, there was ways in which it was modular. There are ways in which you could kind of plug different elements in or pull different elements out. 
And so Monster Hearts emerges mechanically from Apocalypse World, um, but takes it in a really kind of different direction, obviously, and pulls some of the mechanics out wholesale and puts in totally new ones. Strings exist in Monster Hearts, which is kind of like your control over the heart strings of your fellow characters um, and your ability to kind of leverage their emotions to get what you want. Um, so that doesn't exist in Apocalypse World, and that's key to Monster Hearts. Um, but mechanically, it originates in Apocalypse World. Yeah. Now, so I'd be curious, now, did you come across that first as, as being part of the Forge community? Um, yeah, I, I first encountered Apocalypse World at, um, I think it's a convention named GameStorm in Portland. Vincent happened to be there as a guest of honor. And at that point, Apocalypse World was in this kind of ash can beta release version where the playbooks were all these little like you take a piece of paper and you cut it in the middle and you fold it in a specific way. So it's like a 16 page micro booklet that fits yep. in the palm of your hand. And the the book, I think, had like a hand bound cover. And so it was this 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 early release kind of special item. And so I got to start playing Apocalypse World when it was in its um, just like pre-release phase, which was kind of exciting. And um, I mean, hilariously, the same thing happened as with D and D. Um, I was playing Apocalypse World with a group that um, had a lot of different ideas about ap what Apocalypse World was. Luckily, that tension was a lot more fruitful. Going leading out of that group, um, John Stone Metzger went on to design um, Dungeon Planet and another thing. I went on to design Monster Hearts. Adam Cobal went on to co-design Dungeon World. Uh, Daniel went on to become my editor and push back against a bunch of my thinking in terms of how I was designing Monster Hearts. And so Andrew Gillis went on to design Girl by Moonlight. And so there was just this this real explosion of creative, um, moving in different creative directions from that initial Apocalypse World game at that table, which was fascinating. But uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of my origin with Apocalypse World. Um, it It's something that my design career bounced off of a lot over that over many years after initially playing it. So uh, what came first for you, Avery? Was it this concept of of role playing teenagers and dealing with identity as teenagers and the angst of teenagers and the relationships of being a teenager and that discovery? Or was it was it Apocalypse World um, inspired you to explore that? I'm trying to get a sense of chicken and the egg here. Yeah, I don't know if there's chicken and egg so much as like two cars colliding. Um, okay. So the first car <laughs> is Apocalypse World. And then the second car is the the whole cultural backlash to Twilight. Interesting. Um, now, I've never read the books, the Twilight books. I've watched all the movies. Um, the first one is just genius. A beautiful movie. Um, I will go on a rant about how it's great. Um, mostly to be contrarian, uh, to be honest, but, but, um, <laughs> the thing, the thing about Twilight is, um, regardless of the quality of writing, regardless of the quality of movie making, there was this, uh, frenzied cultural phenomenon of dogpiling on, uh, the fans of this franchise and talking about how stupid they were. And now these are, these are almost exclusively teenage girls and lonely housewives who like Twilight, <laughs> right? Like we know that. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, and then we just have like all of these like highly educated, you know, uh, college educated men who have a lot of time during their off hours of their programming job to just write 5,000 word blog posts about how Twilight is stupid, picking it apart word by word. Um, right. Right. Do you remember this? I, very vaguely. So my wife is a huge fan of the books um, uh -huh. and she was had mixed feelings about the movie. She watched them all. So uh, to answer your question, I've not I think I've watched the first movie um, and I've never read the book. So it, my, my view is limited through her eyes in that respect. Um, I just I do know what you're talking about happened, but I didn't see a first person. So this is fascinating. Yeah. So it was it was just people weren't taking a step back and and asking like, who are we ridiculing? Who are we calling stupid? It, does it make sense for 35-year-old grown men on the internet to be spending their days talking about how teenage girls are stupid? Is that, is that a good place for us to move culturally? 
Um, or perhaps do we need a different, more nuanced, more complicated approach to talking about these books? Um, and because at the same time, like there was a Halo novelization series at the at the same time that there was Twilight being released. No one, no one was going line by line through the Halo books, right? They were trash. Teenage right. boys loved them. They were giving <laughs> teenage boys bad gender ideas. Right. No one particularly cared. But Twilight, Twilight was the devil, right? And so, again, it's, I was at the time young and very contrarian. And so the more people said Twilight is trash, the more I was like, no, Twilight is not trash. You're not allowed to say that. I'm going to defend it. I'm going to go to bat to it. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about how it is an important cultural touchstone. And so that's the second car. Apocalypse World is the first car. They smashed together one day. I'm I'm making I'm just like on the Apocalypse World forums, kind of like putting together almost joke mechanics, um, right? Like, oh yeah, working on this Twilight game, haha. Here's my here's my new move, and uh, and then someone was like, you should actually make this, and I was like, wow. oh, you're right. Actually, I um I didn't realize it, but I have uh, a bunch of feelings about how uh, these stories about the complicated, terrible decisions that teenagers make when they're in love um, or they're in lust, like those stories aren't given a place at the table yet. And so that's that's where Monster Hearts came from. So I'd be curious if we if, if we can dig into that a little bit more, because this is this is fascinating to me. Do you remember the first time you saw the first movie was it? And did your thoughts about the movie change or did you start off with an emotional reaction to the movie and then were able to figure out why what caused that? Or was it truly, you know, people are pushing against this and I'm going to push back? Or was it all of those things? <laughs> yeah, maybe it was all of those things. Um, yeah, I. I saw Twilight in theaters with someone I had a crush on. I saw it uh, uh, only for the reason that I had the crush on the person who invited me. Um, and I thought it was a whatever movie. Um, and it was absolutely <laughs> that contrarianness to like, I don't think we as a culture should spend all of our time ridiculing teenage girls that, um, that pushed me into this place of being like, actually, something? I want to create media that is about this. Wow, that, that that's absolutely fascinating. So you get uh, you put out your, you know, you're throwing a couple uh, mechanics out there and someone says, you know, Avery, this is you've got something here. What happens next now? When do you start to really kind of piece together the next iteration of this concept? I think I dove in and I created a prototype version um, really quickly and I got it out there yeah. and people started playing it and said, like, it is flawed, but really exciting. Um, and I got cold feet on the project. I think I was like, do I really want to be investing what could be years of my life into yeah. bringing these stories about like messy, terrible, hormonal teenagers? Um, I knew that the media that I was engaging with was fraught and problematic. Like that wasn't over my head in any way, but I, right. but Monster Hearts was working to like interrogate that to like spell out, like here are the mechanics by which this like vampire abusive boyfriend, like ho holds sway over people and kind of, I feel like putting those mechanics into play with this really like intentional, like, what do you do? What do you do when it's spelled out for you? Um, when it's spelled out for your, your character, or at least for you as a player, um, there were, there was a queering of the, of the content as well. Um, there was, um, kind of leveraging the fact that teenagers are confused and right. horny and impulsive um, and constantly vying for power over one another. Um, the there's a, there's a lot of room for people having feelings that they don't understand and having to grapple with them. And so there's, there's just so much space in the genre to start exploring queer themes and that opportunity is rarely taken. Um, and so Monster Hearts really pushed in that direction as well. One of the things that I found fascinating, Avery, um, as, I as I was learning about Monster Hearts and reading about it, and, and not only reading Monster Hearts, but reading about Monster Hearts, is um, the concept of the, the, the like, and, and correct me if I'm, I'm phrasing this incorrectly, like, like the structural conflicts and difficulties between the players. Like, it, it, I, I, one of the, my initial thoughts was it was interesting that Avery decided to make this a player versus an antagonistic non-player does that make sense like i like it, it, the like like 
you you embrace. I mean, all right, I'm gonna try this again. It, it seems like you embraced that the difficulties and the and the complicated relationships and the antagonism. Um, and, and I'd be curious to know: was there a point in time where you said, you know, I, I'm I'm not going to trust a GM to handle these conflicts. I want the players to handle these conflicts. Does that make sense? I think it does make sense because I think that one of the the key things that you're getting at here is that the role of the MC or the the game master in Monster Hearts is not to be pushing the major plot arc. It's to be stirring the pot. Yeah. Um, and and what that plot ends up being is mostly tensions between the player characters. Um and and when whenever those tensions, you know, they start to die down, people start to step up and be their better selves. The the MC reaches in and is like, okay, but what about this? This twist of the knife. That probably gets you all uh, at each other's throats again, right? And the answer is always yes, because the mechanics really push in that direction. Um, yeah, a, a big part of why um, I was interested in that is because I was really interested in uh, having a game that was about emotional leverage. Um, it's very interesting. And having a game that was about um, pressure cooker situations. And Apocalypse World... Um, I think is really interesting because you can have like this like big scary boss in the wasteland right like the the villain in the mad max movie and depending on how these these roles go or the, like these moves that the the players make it's really clear that like hey they they could just make a series of moves that kills that that big baddie like you're not introducing a big baddie being like this is a level 27 encounter that's that's not right. on the table for you you as the the mc have to Except that anything you put on the table, they have the potential to blow up. Um, yeah. And, and you're not there to um, to create unsolvable problems. You're there to like to put danger on the table and see what they do next. And to accept that you don't have control over where the story goes. Um, and so for me, writing Monster Hearts, I knew that that pressure cooker situation, like you can't actually introduce it externally you have to you have to stoke it from within. The players are the ones with the, with the most agency, so you have to invite them to use that agency to get at one another if you want that pressure cooker situation to emerge in the story. Does that make sense? It does. It makes a ton of sense to me. So um, as I talk to designers and creators, um, I'm very fascinated by... Uh, you know, the series of iterations, right? You know, as you go through and you make changes and things like that, can you, looking back at it, um, I keep hearing about uh, the final aha iteration. Um, and I haven't quite put a word to it and I haven't heard anybody else put a word to it, but it seems like I keep hearing someone say, you know, yeah. And then, you know, I changed this one thing and all of a sudden it all clicked. Uh, I, I solved a problem that I hadn't even defined yet. And I wonder if that happened with you with Monster Hearts, where there, there was a, a moment and it could be a major change or a, or a minor change through the iterations where it just all finally fell together for you. I don't know that there was a um, turning point where everything suddenly felt like it came together, but there was a point fairly late in the development of the first edition of the game where it felt like that missing puzzle piece was put into place. Um and that is that the game has growing up moves and Ooh, um, there's kind of this like a uh, season by season plot arc kind of um, set up to the story um, or to the game where um, uh, after a certain point, usually five or six sessions in, you um, you trigger a, a mechanical thing where, OK, the next episode is our finale. Like the next time we get together and play the game as a group of people, that's our final uh, session of this plot arc. And then we're going to stop playing. Um, if we want to pick it up again after, you know, we play some D and D or have some board game nights or something, we can do that later. But like, this is the season is coming to a close. Um, and, um, that felt really good because Monster Hearts tends to have play that like, um, starts at a simmer and then quickly gets to a full boil and then is like exploding. Um, right. and it's only interesting to tell stories that are hovering at that constant explosion, place for so long um and so and so seasons are, are a way of saying like um we're not trying to do this forever that wouldn't make sense like becky ate half the football team um you don't come back from that really um, <laughs> damn it becky <laughs> so we're, we're gonna we're gonna hit you know we're gonna hit our season finale now it's prom 
Um, and after that, we're like, we're, we're done. Maybe we yeah. come back for senior year later. Maybe we re- reboot some of the characters for that. But like, this is our arc. And one of the things that that that, se- that end of season kind of phase opens up is certain season advances. So you can normally, you know, like level up your stats, take new moves. But then these ones, one of the things you can take is growing up moves. And so you've you've got these these normal moves you've been using this whole season that are all about shutting people down, lashing out at people, running away in panic, trying to like get emotional um, leverage over people. And then suddenly the growing up moves are on the horizon and maybe you take one of those and now you can like stand up for somebody. Mm -hmm. Right. You can you can uh, broker peace. You can take the high road. And this is just something that you didn't really know how to do before. And now you can do it. Um, And although it's a small part of the game and not one that necessarily every group even like accesses, um, I think that that far off place of and maybe one day you'll actually grow up and you'll overcome these uh, pitfalls that you keep on falling into over and over again um, really help to frame what the game is about. The game is about contending with your worst impulses and seeing whether you overcome them. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I would imagine, too, Avery, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like, you know, by doing that, um, you know, you you make sure that you don't dilute that rolling boil, right? So you, you, if you spend, I would imagine, too much time playing at that, that apex of, uh, of the, you know, the, the, you know, the beginning of the third act or the, the mid third act, it dilutes that. But whereas by putting those, putting the bookends and having those seasons there, it allows those to not last forever and to be special. Does it, would that, would that be accurate? Yeah, I think it's good to have, it's good to have peaks and valleys in your storytelling and it's good to have like a direction and counter direction. And so there's a real um, uh, intention there with like the first session always starts in your homeroom. Like you determine your seating chart and you kind of learn a little bit about your classmates and then you play out what is typically initially a day where everyone's bored at school. Like there's a little bit of like a finding your ground Um, and then things slowly start to build. Right. Someone passes a note to someone else or or something like that. And it builds and and quite reliably, it builds to the place where Becky ate half the football team or like someone is, you know, putting like a, a curse on someone else to have all their teeth fall out and have them slowly wither away or, um, you know, something. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, people are breaking up. People are getting together behind other people's backs. All of the, the chaos and drama and tension and and all of that. But but you, you don't really want to start there and have nowhere to go. Right. And so you, you right. start in you start in homeroom and there's some GM advice that like if you have one of those like big, like climactic moments or those big like peaks, maybe like, you know, halfway through your second session, you know, that big fight goes down, someone dies, someone cheats on someone, whatever, like you return Monday morning to history class, right? Like you, mm. you, you keep going back and being like, and also we're dealing with mundane teenager stuff. Right. Um, and then, yeah, you get to this like season climax and there's like the often big showdowns or big chaos, but you've also got these season advances opening up and they, there, there's this offer to turn back from the brink of total mutual destruction. Um, <laughs> which I wish I had in high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's fascinating. So when Monster Hearts initially gets out there and um, it starts to get noticed, it starts to get picked up. I'm always fascinated about a creator's reaction uh, to the reactions, um, both positive and negative. Um, so uh, when you look back at that, you know, when it's really starts to catch and you really start hearing discussions happening about it, was there things that were... Um, said and done with the game that surprised you in a good way and was there um things that happened with the game that um that surprised you maybe and disappointed you a bit um yeah i mean there there was a range of reactions there were people who said like this game is problematic because it Mm -hmm. deals with teenage sexuality and violence um uh and it's easy to uh when looking at a piece of media mistake interrogation for endorsement um interesting and so um there are people who said like this is problematic and my response is kind of like 
yes by design <laughs> but, but by by design and and if i have not been accountable in how i have presented that then that's an interesting conversation but like are these bad people who do bad things like yes like most good media that is true um yep. there are people there was a surprising amount of people who liked the game i didn't think it was going to have the reach that it did um because like i said it emerged from a cultural moment where people really loved to talk extensively about how dumb twilight was and i really came out being like hey here's a twilight game um not exclusively but but definitely like i'm i'm not hiding that route um yeah so a lot more people liked it than i thought there was one critique that really stood out um and it was by lillian cohen moore um it was an article on uh a website called bitch magazine which is like a feminist magazine that also does an online portion and she was talking about how the game explores fraught territory without providing enough tools to make sure that it's done in a safe way and so that's that's the um am i being accountable in how i tackle problematic media and the critique really hit home. And so I developed a supplement for the game called Safe Hearts that was about <laughs> various techniques and tools for playing the game in a way that felt good for everyone at the table. When I went on to do a um, second edition of the game that got released in 2016, um, 2016, 2017, that became a full chapter of the game. Um, so so there's, there's kind of some explicit tools, things like the X card. Um, and there's also just some, some stuff in there about like, hey... When you're introducing fraught content, um, here is how you read the room. Here is how hmm. you take a break. Here's how you ask whether people want to go there. And so there's, mm -hmm. and then also like, if something comes up in a game that like makes you feel distressed, um, here's my recommendation on like how to handle that. Step one is do use all the tools you already have that you've accumulated from across the course of your life because. Nobody's going to be able to write a role playing game that has better instructions for how to take care of yourself than like what you already know about yourself. Um, but but like additionally, here is some support. Um, and so that. Um, yeah, that felt like a really meaningful critique that I took to heart that transformed the way the second edition book reads. Um, and it also reflects, I think, a trend that occurred um, in the time between the first and second edition, right? In the in that period between like 2010 to to now, there's now a big focus on like if you're telling fraught stories, like have tools for the players to like <clears throat> hit the rewind button or tap yeah. out or say like, can we gloss over this? Um, because like ultimately we don't know how one another's brains work. We don't know what's going to be upsetting for one another. I could. You know, I could name a, an NPC in a game Catherine and not realize that, like, your mom's name was Catherine and she died last week, right? Like, it's not even, like, big triggering, uh, like, terrible problematic things. It can be just, like, things that we don't know will catch someone else off guard. And just, like, having having the tools and the social contract to just, like, prioritize everyone having fun um, is so important. And that's, like, that's something that I've seen develop in the community over the last 10 years. And it's something that was like a different expectation standard between the first and second edition of Monster Hearts. I was fascinated um, with the fact that that type of conversation was happening in this part of the hobby because I was um, mostly involved in the miniature gaming tabletop hobby. And when I came back to role playing, there was there was conversations that were happening within within this hobby that weren't happening anywhere else that I could see. And uh, it was very, very fascinating. But part of it is, I think, by the nature of what we're doing, right? Um, it's one thing to push some models around and roll some dice and have them, you know, battle it out. We're doing something different with role playing. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it, it was very, very interesting to see that. So and this ties into really one of the last things um, that I thought was interesting is how you handle consent from a player to player aspect, right? So I'm sorry, a character to character aspect. And in, and consent, it feels like, and correct me if I'm wrong, it feels like a big part of the game in, in dealing with consent from a character standpoint versus from a player standpoint and balancing that. Was that something that you identified early um, or uh, 
how did, how did, how did that come together for you? Because I found that very, very interesting how it's handled differently and talked about differently uh, in your work. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that there's, <clears throat> there's an important distinction there for sure. Like we are attempting to tell stories about characters feeling bad and miserable. Uh, about their relationships with one another. But if we as players sitting around the table are also feeling bad or miserable about our relationships at the table, like we're definitely doing something wrong. Um, and so and so there needs to be that kind of like the, those two levels of awareness of like um, of we want to make our characters feel a different way than we feel. Um, and there's um, there's a difference between my character hates this and I as a player hate this. Um, but sometimes those really overlap, right? And so being yep. being having the tools to figure out how your character feels and reacts and also separate tools for how you as a player feel and react felt really important. Um, yeah. And on the, on the character level, in that fictional level, um, there, a lot of the game is about getting leverage over one another. And one of the ways mm-hmm. that, that characters do that is by turning one another on. Um, when you, when your character turns another character on, um, you get a string on them. So you get, you get power over them. Um, and now they're choosing, like, they're probably feeling flustered. Are they, are they reacting like defensively? Are they panicking and like lashing out at you? Are they, are they like acting foolish and and tripping over their own desk? Are they, um, leaning into the feeling? Um, and so there's, there's, um, uh, emphasis put in those mechanics of saying like that turns one on move tells you how your character feels that's not something mm-hmm. you have control over but how your character reacts to their feelings that is something that you have 100 percent control over no one can tell you what you do uh next um they can but the, the mechanics do say listen you feel this way in your body figure out what that means to you um uh, I'm not saying that your character is gay. I'm just saying that right. when your character got tackled by Brad on the field, slammed down into the mud, and now you're all dirty, that made you feel a certain way. Well, how do you reconcile yourself with that? Um, and so, and so, yeah, there, there, that's a, an approach to player character agency that is different from other games. Um, yep. Other games sometimes actually do the opposite, right? They'll tell you what your character does next, but you but don't have control over your thoughts and feelings. And Monster Hearts just inverts that and sees what happens. That You know, I never thought about it that way. That is that is 100%. That, that makes it, that clarifies a lot of it for me because the, um, the, the, the discussions that I was reading as I was getting ready to talk to you, um, I, I couldn't put my finger on some of it, but that that clarifies it perfectly. Awesome. <laughs> <I'm> perfect. <laughs> and um, uh, it also helps me understand why the second edition came out um, and, the, and the tools and the changes that you made for that. So, guys, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back from this break, I want to talk about uh, kind of the next big game that Avery put together. It's called The Quiet Year. We'll be right back. Howdy friends, Craig here. You deserve a new play mat. Here on the third floor, we use mats by Mars. They are scratch resistant, waterproof, wet erase marker compatible, almost free of glare and lighter than neoprene. Mats by Mars gives you over 40 designs to choose from. You pick a mat, pick a design, and then you pick an overlay, like one for Marvel Crisis Protocol, Star Wars Legion, or even Malifaux 3rd Edition. Those overlays will really speed up your deployment and make the placement of objective markers so easy. Use our promotion code in the show notes to get a 10% discount on your first order. In the notes of your order, you can even request the third floor logo on your mat for free. That makes the best mat in the business even a little better. So get some new mats, save yourself some money, and help support the show. Go to matsbymars.com. All the details are in the show notes, including the discount code. So every soon after, uh, relatively soon after the release of Monster Hearts, we see the quiet year come out. Um, I want to do the same thing, if it's okay, and kind of go back and and learn um, where the beginnings of the quiet year is. Maybe we should start by giving people an idea of what the quiet year is. Yeah. um, So the quiet year is a weird game. Um, It is (laughs) 
mostly a role playing game. Um, I describe it as a map drawing game about community. And the way that the quiet year works is you collectively tell a story about a community that is that has experienced the collapse of civilization and that has a year of relative peace to rebuild and reassess and figure out what their collective identity is. Um, it is not a story told through individual characters like most role playing games are. Instead, um, uh, every it's played in turns. Every turn is a week. Um, uh, every week opens by drawing a card from the deck. Um, as there are 52 cards in a deck, there are 52 weeks in a year. As there are four suits, there are four seasons. And so you proceed through spring, summer, fall, and winter, um, being kind of hit with new challenges and opportunities and surprises every week, and then determining uh, how you respond as a community. And rather than playing individual characters, you kind of play as the collective of the community, as the currents of thought and the pools of workers and the uh, the voices in the town square. Um, and so it is more of a bird's eye view um, kind of um, game. But you, you're kind of choosing every week, like, do we spend this week holding an important conversation, starting an important project, or discovering more about the world we live in? Um, and as you're doing this, you're, you're uh, drawing things on this map that is constantly evolving. And there's a lot of like actual cartography, right? There's mountains and forests, but then there's also like, here's this image of a skull next to a lollipop that represents something. And so at the end, you, you have this map that is completely unintelligible to someone who has right. not played the quiet year. But if you've played the quiet year, looking at it, you know exactly what it is. You're like, that's a quiet year map. Um, and I something? don't know what that lizard thing is, but I can see all of the skulls around it and the little dots to mark conversations that occurred. And I get a sense of what probably happened here. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I reading about the game, uh, Avery, and then, um, you know, uh, hearing you just describe it the way you did, it, it begs the initial question, like, where the hell did this come from? Like, where are the beginnings of the of these concepts? Because there's so many interesting, different concepts, not only from Monster Hearts, but from what was what was out there in 2013. Yeah, it's. um. So I, this one's a little bit harder to disentangle than the Monster Hearts question. The Monster Hearts question was like, I took Twilight and I took Apocalypse World and I kind of smushed them together. <laughs> Um, but, but this one, I guess going back earlier in my game design career, I had, um, repeatedly approached design from this place of trying to invert common design expectations. Um, and so my first game that I ever published perfect was about criminals in this kind of Victorian dystopian setting that was all about like repression and stifling the individual will. And, um, kind of, it's got this. Clockwork Orange, V for Vendetta, um, Brazil, you know, like all, all of those kind of like yeah. re repressive dystopian police state kind of stories. Um, and you're you're playing people who go out and um, and exercise your will anyways, like people who go out and commit crimes um, and potentially these crimes are like robbing banks or things we think of as crimes. But potentially they're things like. Even though you have signed an oath to never again speak you go and like read poetry in this underground group in a cellar somewhere or something like that. So a lot of, a lot of the stories are about people who like connect to art and passion and culture and connection and relationships and, and revolutionary potential and things like this. Um, and perfect. One of the initial design conceit was that uh, nothing on your character sheet tells you what you can do. It all tells you things you can't do. Um, Interesting. Like, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. Um, and, and you figure out how to, how to be yourself in this world. Um, and that design conceit didn't hold all the way through to, like, the final development, but that was the, the impetus. And then right. in 2009, when I re released Ribbon Drive, which is a game about road trips and music and self-discovery, um, at that time, the indie role-playing game design scene was really obsessed with conflict. Every scene had conflict and there was a conflict role and you set stakes of the conflict. And it was just it was, it was very like you'd be sitting down to play and you'd be having like this nice character dialogue 
And someone who was quite design minded, uh, who was up to date on all the latest design trends would lean forward and say, okay, but where's the conflict? Um, and I got a bit sick of hearing that. And so Ribbon Drive was uh, designed from this initial place of like, we had a game where there is no conflict. At any point at which there is conflict, uh, the most obvious opp opportunity is just to take a detour. <laughs> and we just switch CDs that we're listening to and you know, the road trip goes in a different direction. What if it was just all about conflict avoidance? And what if that was wow. actually the central theme and uh, every road trip was ultimately about what you were trying to get away from? And you were all about letting go of your expectations of the future. So this was just like the conflict avoidance role playing game. Um, and so <laughs> the quiet year, similarly, um, a lot of the time when we're telling stories in role playing games, we're telling stories about my character, right? Like my individual and what my individual does with their personal skills. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And the quiet year, I think the initial design impetus was what if this was a story about our community? our resources and our priorities. Well, and it's the other part that I thought was very interesting about it, Avery, and I'd like to get a sense because it kind of I think it might tie to this a little bit is this is not usually the part of the story that we tell, right? Usually we're going to tell the story before or after the quiet year. Um, but this is this is the uh, the downbeat um, that to to that process. So w was that also you just saying, I want to I want to tackle a different part of what everybody else is doing right now? I think so. Yeah. And it's interesting because people, especially people approaching role playing games from like a Dungeons and Dragons background, have often actually used the quiet year to create their setting that they then right? they're like, OK, something apocalyptic happened. Then we establish our community and then our adventurers, you know, after the end of the quiet year. Um, that's when our adventurers begin their D&D campaign, which is which is cool, which is interesting. It's in a, a totally unexpected use case for the game. Um, yeah. But also it's like not what the quiet year is going for, right? The quiet year is going for like, what if stories about how we as a community make choices are enough? What if we don't actually need like that climax ever? That's it's, it's, it's really interesting. Avery. Very, very interesting. I'd be, um, how do I want to put this? Um, let's say that I, uh, by the quiet year today, sit down, read it, uh, play it. And um, then we're able to pop back in time to some of the early iterations. What, what were things that that were there at the beginning that are still there now um, through all of the different changes that you made to it? What what stayed the same? Um, so the very, very first iteration of the prototype um, had you drawing a, a prompt card every week and um, reacting to that prompt card and then drawing something on the map. Um, I played that version with like a little deck of cards that I put together once. And the person I played it with, another game designer by the name of Jackson Tegu, like looked at me and was like, you do you know how a playing card deck works? And I was like, uh, I, I think so. I don't quite know what that question <laughs> means. And, and he kind of broke down like there are 52 cards as there are 52 weeks in a year. There are 13 ranks as there are 13 moons in a year. There are four suits as there are four seasons, two light suits and two dark suits as, you know, with the positioning of the solstices or the, the equinoxes, there is, you know, light half and a dark half of the year. Like the, the playing card deck is a year. That, that's what it is. Um, and so obviously that was, was a little like, mind blowing, for, I bet. <laughs> thank you for that uh, mind blowing moment. Obviously, that is now the basis <laughs> of the entire game. That's um, so funny. So, um, I mean, interestingly, like it. It's, it's such a good conceit, right? That this playing yeah. card deck is, is the year. I actually encountered um, a, a friction where 52 turns is just kind of too many turns for the game. Um, it's you, you randomize the cards in each individual suit. So you actually have 13, 39, anywhere from 40 to 52 weeks total. But there's also like a, a, a suggestion early on in the text of like, Maybe you want to play a shorter year, just pull four cards out of every um, out of every season. Make sure not to pull the, the King of Spades because that's the card that ends the, the game. Um, and I actually prefer that that variant. But but the elegance of that conceit of 52 cards, 52 weeks was was too much to ever compromise on. Ultimately. Let go of. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so a similar question that I asked you about Monster Hearts, was there um, a change that was made through the iterations that you consider uh, seminal or, or monumental um, as far as what the game ended up being? Yeah, the game introduced factions at one point, and then they got eliminated. So that was one of the two things that I considered uh, really pivotal is the decision like, no, we're like, we're really not teams here. We are an amorphous blob of community feelings um, and community choices. Um, factionalism can emerge and can shift over time between us players. I can be kind of speaking as the voice of the secessionists for a, a little while, and then you can be later on. Things can surface and submerge again. Um, but there was no fix, like, I'm on this side of the community and you're on that side. Um, right. And then the other thing... Uh, so in the game has this mechanic called contempt tokens. Um, and uh, if ever someone makes a choice that you feel like you weren't honored and respected in that choice as a community member, you know, whoever you're imagining you're thinking as in that moment, you can take a contempt token and put it in front of you. Um, and in the, the physical version of the game, these are little skulls. So mm -hmm. the players are potentially over the course of the year building up small piles of skulls and resentment in front of them um, <laughs> and still trying to negotiate in hopefully good faith with their other community members. Um, and contempt tokens kind of represent the fact that like, ultimately, if we had all the time in the in the world, of course, we would do a thorough needs assessment for every project. We would consult everyone. We would reach consensus and we would also like initiate every project in a timely fashion and complete it on schedule. <laughs> Obviously, right. if we could do all those things, we would. Um, uh, because we're, you know, highly intelligent people. But we don't have that luxury, not in the real world and definitely not in the post collapse of civilization world. <laughs> and so every turn, it's, it's that choice of like, do we spend more time talking? Do we spend more time searching or do we just start? And if we just start, who are we pissing off? And if we just delay starting, who are we pissing off? And so contempt tokens, they, they build um, because you can't anticipate the needs of the community. And ultimately, you have to take action in various ways. Um, and there was a point at which you could spend contempt tokens to do certain things. Um, and the other pivotal moment was um, just removing any option to do anything with the tokens other than have them sit in front of you. And so some people say like, well, that the contempt tokens don't do anything in the game, mm -hmm. um, which I always think is interesting. Uh, whenever someone tells me having visible uh, signs that other people are displeased with me is isn't doesn't do anything. Uh, that's a very different kind of person than I am. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, oh, interesting, because when someone has a visible sign of displeasure with me, that forces me to reevaluate my entire life and change yeah. every action from that point forward forever. <laughs> Um, funny. but but they you can't spend them it's true you can't spend them you can't trigger a, another mechanical interaction um when there are past grievances they just linger forever um and that's just a reflection of my experience in community you can stop talking about it you can potentially get over it but they're always still there little skulls yeah. in front of everyone so i'm, I'm very fascinated um when designers there's almost like two phases in this process as I'm starting to learn more and more about it, because the one thing I'm not is a game designer. So it, um, it, it, it's it, this is all uh, very interesting and new to me. Um, and I'm, I'm very much an outsider and a consumer, right, um, uh, of the games that, that people are making. And it, it's interesting to me, the, you know, phase one is the, the design, the iterations, the play tests, the monitored play tests and things like that, where you have... Um, control over uh, every aspect like literally you could have a game played today and then tomorrow you change it completely right because it's yours and then at some point it's out there um and you no longer have that control and i'm not implying that you would want that control but um i am interested when i hear designers talk about what happens when a game like the quiet year coat goes out there did you see it um being played or discussed in a way that you didn't anticipate Sometimes, or actually, I, I don't think I ever saw it being played in a way that I didn't anticipate, but I did see it being um, reacted to in a way that I didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. There are um, there are kind of rules. So like when it when it's your turn and you draw a card 
it's your opportunity to make a decision about what the community does in reaction to that card. The other players like aren't they're not tossing in suggestions. They're not making mm. the decision for you. It's like, you know, you draw a card and it's like something an old relic was discovered. Some people say it's cursed. Do you use it or destroy it? Um, that's your choice. And right. and so there there is and there there is a because conversations in community are often constrained like you can't Mm -hmm. you can't hold a town hall in which everyone gets to speak as much as they want to on every single thing that's not actually realistic or or feasible um and so to model constraints on conversation and community um there is not like a freewheeling ongoing discussion about what people should do next there's an action of like hold a discussion and, and it's like you know you open with a question or a statement you go around in a circle and everyone gets to weigh in with a statement um we're talking like one or two sentences here. Um, right. And so um, some people, who, especially people I think who are approaching it with more of a board gamey kind of lens, um, uh, reacted to that in like a pretty like, uh, cool. So there, there's really like your turn is your turn. Um, and we're, we're rotating who is constructing the next part of the the community story. Some people reacted to that in this really like, these rules are draconian. You must be silent. Like you are not allowed to speak unless it is the ritual speaking, Um, which is like a very extreme interpretation. It's definitely not the the intent of the game. The intent of the game is just to empower each player in turn to like make meaningful choices Um, in cooperative games. I don't know, like in cooperative board games, for example, um, usually what happens is you sit down with four people one of the people has played more of this sort of game and can look at the board and can ask what's in everyone's hands and then can like figure out like, okay, if Mary plays this card and then Beth moves on to this space and then John does this and then I do this and then Beth and Mary do this and then, right, like they can, they can just kind of anticipate. And then if people want to win, they just let this person dictate their turns in sequence over and over and over and over again. And the quiet year yep. really works to create a different dynamic that that's fascinating to me uh avery because it's it's a challenge that i have playing cooperative games um is stopping myself from being that guy um or you know allowing it to be a truly collaborative thing so it's really interesting that you identified that problem and 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 put a solution in place for it that's fascinating cool thank you (laughs) <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, guys, let's take another quick break. When we get back from this break, we're going to talk about uh, a more recent game, one that came out just a few years ago, Dream is Cute. We'll be right back. There are so many online retailers. It can be hard to find one that is trustworthy, has great prices, along with some reliable customer service. On the third floor, we love ordering our gaming goodies from Gadzooks Gaming. Their selection of terrain, miniatures, dice, custom decor, and conversion bits are curated for gamers by gamers. You'll find they have what you need and what you didn't know you needed to take your gaming fun to the next level. If you mention Third Floor Wars in the cart notes of your order, you'll also get a free gift and you'll help support the podcast. Check out gadzooksgaming.com and mention Third Floor Wars on checkout to get that free gift. So this, just like, you know, uh, the game we just got to, or really both games that we've already talked about is a, is a very unique game. It's called Dream Askew. It was released in 2019. And boy, did it get some attention. It got nominated uh, for several Ennies uh, for the best game, the best setting, and the product of the year. So before I really even want to talk about the game, um, what was finding that out like? It was exciting. Um, you know, it's it's interesting because I've been invited to be... Um, a speaker or a guest of honor at a bunch of conventions. I've gotten to be flown around to do workshops and things like that. And whenever people are like working on writing an introduction for me or a bio or a little splash thing on their website, they will um, they will often say award winning game designer Avery Alder. And I like always have to. It's really unfortunate. I always have to correct them and say, like, actually, that's not true. Actually, I'm an award, I, I've, award nominated. <laughs> I, I, I won like a side award on a 2012 indie RPG 
awards thing, but I don't I don't quite feel like that is the level of prestige that one requires to be introduced at conventions as an award winning game designer. So I'm always like, well, you could say award nominated game designer if you want to. Yeah. Um, and so uh, Dream Askew uh, getting nominated for these awards was really exciting. Um, it's actually a book that contains two games, Dream Askew and also Dream Apart um, by a collaborator named Benjamin Rosenbaum. Um, and so these are two games that kind of exist in dialogue. They use the same system and explore it in really different settings and different um, kind of directions. But um, it getting nominated for these awards was really exciting. Um, at the same time, there's kind of this bittersweetness where the Ennies is, um, it is really oriented towards broad mainstream appeal. Um, it tends to go towards... Uh, Wizards of the Coast or Pathfinder, Paizo, like, products. Um, And if not those, then, like, something really interesting in that fantasy adventure game uh, still. And so, yeah, I I had this feeling of, like, oh, this is great. Now I can put multiple award-nominated game designer. Um, But, yeah, I don't know. I'm really proud of the book. It was exciting for it to get that that kind of uh, recognition and that kind of platform uh, I didn't expect it to win those because a book that contains a game about a queer collective trying to rebuild their community and a game about a Jewish shtetl community navigating relationships in the mid 1800s like probably isn't uh, isn't going to hook the Ennies audience in particular. Um, uh, but it, yeah, it was it was it was exciting. It was an honor to be nominated still. So I'd be curious, Avery, was uh, your connection with Benjamin early on in the process or was it late in the process? Well, so in 2013, I put out a prototype version of Dream Askew as a Patreon release. And at that point, I was like, great, this is a 13 page game. Um, People will be able to figure it out if they can and not if they can't. And I'm done with it, probably. And then a couple of years later, Benjamin emails me and says, like, hey, I've been working on this game that I want to explore about life um, in a small Jewish shtetl community. And I actually want to use your your framework and your game engine. Do I have your blessing for that? And I said, yes, um, just like keep me in the loop and show me what you're working on. And Benjamin comes back and has these innovations on the system. And I'm like, oh, that's really exciting. I want to yeah. steal that back for Dream Askew. And then I guess if I did that, I would do this. And then Benjamin yeah. would be like, that's really great. And if I incorporated that, then I would do this. And so we started kind of bouncing back and forth. And it pulled me back into working on Dream Askew. And Dream Askew was really like transformed by Benjamin's wow. ideas. And it got to a place where we decided like it would be really cool to release these two games as a book um, to include like how to play these games, all the materials for Dream Askew, all the re- materials for Dream Apart. And then a chapter on how to design your own games using this game engine. So yeah, it was it was a, a really cool back and forth, like kind of cross informing one another's designs while still having the autonomy to say like as a designer, I'm not including that in my game. My game is right. different in this way, um, which was really fruitful. That's fascinating. So I mean, it, it was a situation where you were working together, but not to make the same game, but you were bou- still bouncing off of each other. You know, it was really cool because. Often with collaboration, it provokes for me a sense of fear. Um, yeah. I like I really love the idea in theory of collaboration. I'm like, that's so utopian to be all working together on art projects. But the moment someone, you know, like I can kill my own darlings in game design. Yeah. But the moment someone else threatens to kill one of my darlings, like I it's hard for me to access that openness and vulnerability that leads to good creative process. Right. Like I get defensive. Yeah. I think that's a normal, natural human reaction collaboration is really hard but the fact that we both had like our projects that existed in dialogue but there were ours like ultimately yeah. i could say like cool our games are not moving in the same direction anymore um it it took the fear out of that process and allowed me to be a lot more open so yeah it was a really cool way to get to collaborate I bet. Now, so thinking back on it, because it could just it could have just as easily been Craig, 
that's that emailed you and I said, hey, you know, Avery, I've got this idea and w- it, you and I could have ended up collaborating. I'd be curious to know when you think back on it, what was unique about you at the time and maybe unique about Benjamin at the time that allowed this to work at all? Yeah, I think so. I think one of the factors was that um, I had written this game about queer community and, um, you know, you the part of the premise of Dream Askew is that like, you are living in the post-apocalyptic world, but the there's no there's never going to be one event, right? Where suddenly everyone goes from living their normal life to living in the wasteland. Like there's there's always going to be waves of events, just like there are now, right? There there are economic crises, there are civil wars, there are things which tear parts of the world up, or that that take a whole class of people and kind of leave them on their own. To fend for themselves. And so Dream Askew kind of just accelerates that into the, the near future and says, like, as a queer community, you have recently fallen out of the society intact. Like your apocalypse came. Now what do you do next? And so there right. are still people who have like, you know, air conditioning uh, in their fancy <laughs> Lexus. They still have shopping malls. They still have gated communities. They have working electricity and running water. You don't. You live out here. So how how do you make it as a community? And when I designed this, I, I was really th- I was really like, this is a game about queer community and like queer separatism. And when Benjamin came to me with his idea for his game about Jewish dental life, Dream Apart, and the kind of like the f- fantastical and the surreal and the whimsical that, that could exist in that setting, um it helped me to better understand what the game that I had written was about. It was about finding, finding belonging because you collectively exist like outside of a larger society, outside of belonging. And so the, the engine for the two games ended up becoming, uh, it's named Belonging Outside Belonging. So they're both games of belonging outside belonging. And, um, and yeah, it was really getting to see the ways in which Benjamin was mirroring my design back at me that helped me to better understand kind of the the breadth of and the the point of what I was designing. Yeah. So w- w- were there times where Benjamin would put that mirror up to you, Avery, and it was easy to digest what you saw and other times when it was hard to digest what you saw? Um, I think it was mostly easy to digest. Um, the, the I guess the thing that was hard for me is that the first design uh, thing that Benjamin came back with was he introduced key relationships in the community, like circle two relationships you have to NBCs in the community. And at the time, Dream Askew didn't have that. And it made me Mm -hmm. really look at it and be like, oh, I like said I was making a game about queer community, but like mostly you're (laughs) you're, you're picking out what your hairstyle is and like how you look and what (laughs) cool stuff you do. Like this is about queer aesthetics. This isn't yet about queer community. And so that really pushed me to to be like, okay, obviously relationships with other people <laughs> needs to be much more central. And I want to build on that by um, by designing this community worksheet that you put in the center that has like a map and some community conflicts that you highlight at the start of play. But like, but yeah, that kind of that kind of struck me and it caused me to reflect a bit about what I mean when I say things like a queer community. Yeah. God, that's that's fascinating. That's fascinating. I can't imagine what that experience must have been like. Um, and, and there there has to be a degree um, and credit to you of, of self awareness and um, to a certain degree, uh, uh, maybe a self confidence that that allows you to reconsider things like that. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I don't know that the I don't know if I would describe it as self confidence, but luckily I had I guess the. Um, the ability to push through embarrassment, maybe I would describe it as. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. And, and was that you, some of your initial feelings, you know, especially in that instance is like, I, you know, I can't believe I missed this. I'm so embarrassed. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that's my initial reaction to almost everything in life. So. <laughs> That's fascinating. Guys, we're going to take one more break. When we get back from this break, I'm going to take advantage of something that we really talked about in the first segment. And that is the fact that Avery has been connected um, through kind of the the over arc of, of, of the changes in role playing. And I, I really want to uh, pick her brain about it. We'll be right back.
Howdy friends, Greg here. Nothing makes Malifaux easier than having the right tools. Here at the third floor, we love all the licensed Malifaux goodies from Custom Meeple. Not only are they helping support this podcast, they sell custom-made weird licensed tokens and terrain. They sell it all. Crew boxes, terrain, markers, tokens, and even a 3x3 full Malifaux board. Custom Meeple sells a complete M3E token set covering every marker and token you need to play. Custom Meeple are the source for the official accessories for Malifaux. Everything is designed by hand and authorized by Weird Games. Check them out at custommeeple.com, that's with one M, or follow the link in the show notes. Up your Malifaux game and be sure to tell them Craig from the third floor sent you. If you use the promo code third floor friend, all one word, T H I R D F L O O R F R I E N D, you'll get a 5% discount and help support the podcast. It's valid on everything except retail products and play mats. Um, so l- listeners know that, um, you know, part of what has prompted me to really focus on the RPG uh, industry and, and people that are creators within this industry is I was just fascinated with the uh, the level of change that happened um, in the last 15, 20, 25 years in the game. And Avery, you know, we talked about it the first segment, you know, how you watched a lot of that. Um, and I think that there's going to be a time um, where, you know, doctorates will be written about kind of what happened um, and how suddenly we now, I think, are at a, at a, at a golden age where role playing is more popular than it's ever been. Um, when you kind of sit back and think about it, Avery, what, what are some of your takeaways and uh, being a historian? What do you think are some uh, some major moments that led us to where we are now? Yeah, um, I mean, that's definitely a big question. I think, I yeah, think we're, been... we're going to do four more four more uh, segments on it, right? <laughs> Sorry, it was a big question. <laughs> no, no, it's great. Um, I definitely think there have been waves um, of of kind of like uh, influence on the direction of design. Um, there were, I mean, I when I started role playing, um, the D twenty open source license for D and D three point five or three point X was was a thing. And there was just Mm -hmm. thousands of um, of splat books and spinoff settings and games based on D and D. You know, there's so many books with like 13 new classes, 14 new fantasy races, 450 new weapons, 120 new relics, 58 new spells. and so that, that was kind of like this this wave. Um, and what I really loved about the first design community that I came into, which was the Forge, as I mentioned earlier, which like wasn't perfect. No design community or movement is ever going to be perfect. But what I really loved about it is that there was this big push to be like, you can design games that are about a specific situation that put specific and interesting constraints on the players. And you can design uh, your system from the ground up. Like your mechanics are created to tell the story that you want to be told at the table. Um, and so the, there is this, this huge wave of games that push towards interesting conflicts that had bespoke unique mechanics and unique engines to tell different kinds of stories. Um, and so that was kind of the wave that I initially entered design on that I feel like really flourished from 2003 to 2009 or maybe a bit beyond that. And then this new wave started <clears throat> with Apocalypse World, where there was this game engine that um, could do really interesting things um, mechanically at its base. One of the things that was going for it is that you roll 2d6 Um it, that creates this nice bell curve. Most results fall in the middle. Um, anything, any result, you know, roll 2d6, add your stat. Any result that's six or lower is like a failure or a, you know, a messy situation. Any result that's seven to nine is a complicated or partial result or partial success or like you get what you want, but you have to make a hard bargain for it. And then a 10 up is like, great, you did it. Um, but I hadn't really encountered games before that... Um, that had those seven to nine results, right? Right. There was a lot of like conflicts were either won or lost, 
um, based on how you engage with the mechanics. In Apocalypse World, because of that 2D6 bell curve, like you're just always shooting towards this messy partial result. And that was what was really interesting mechanically. And then the other thing that's really interesting is that it's like you're just having a conversation at the table until you say something that triggers a move. And when you trigger a move, you know, you roll the dice and you interact with the mechanics and you find out what new direction it shoots you in for your story. Um, and but the modularity of moves combined with that, that 2D6 system that really pushes you towards towards partial success um, alongside the invitation for people to make Apocalypse World their own to tinker with it and also to hack the system um, to design their own games led to this flourishing of a totally new wave of in independent role-playing game design that I hadn't really seen elsewhere of being like, we're going to use the Apocalypse World engine to create a game that's what's called Powered by the Apocalypse. And there are hundreds, yeah. maybe thousands, honestly, of I, Powered I by the Apocalypse be, yeah. World games. Um, Monster Hearts is one of them. Masks by Magpie Games is one of them. Bluebeard's Bride is one of them. Dungeon World. There's just there's there's a lot of games that have had really big commercial and or critical success that have emerged from that. Um, but also like it's just it's really empowering to newer designers or to like designers who don't have the same amount of resources um, to say like here's this engine you're free to use um, and you can plug in your own stuff to it and see what happens. <clears throat> And so now we also see like um, Blades in the Dark by John Harper was released. And um, and there's this and you can use this engine for your own Forged in the Darkness game. And there are. Maybe dozens, I think, of easily of yeah. Forged in the Dark games. And and it started kind of we started seeing this shift. Um, Evil Hat Games put out Fate uh, Core and Fate Accelerated, which is getting it's moving back towards that universal generic mm -hmm. rule system kind of thing. But it has, again, that like modularity and encouragement to like plug your own stuff into this engine. And so we're, we're still in that wave of people being really excited to tinker with one another's engines. Dream Askew in some ways is a power by the apocalypse uh, game, but it's diceless and it's GM less. And uh, it definitely goes far afield. Um, and then it becomes its own engine that other people can do their experiments with. And the same is true for Blades in the Dark. I think it is like a Powered by the Apocalypse initially game that becomes its own engine. And so this, this engine's inspiring new creators to develop new experimental work, which then gets like formulated into a new engine that people can play off of, is, um, yeah, it's this really fascinating design wave. And I'm curious, I, I had this hunch that that we're going to see like a pendulum swing in another direction again, maybe back towards like uh, every game pushes towards its own unique kinds of conflict and has its own bespoke, unique mechanics uh, like we saw from coming from a lot of those earlier forge games, or maybe like right. in a totally new and unpredictable direction. Um, yeah. I, I have no idea, but it's um, it's, it's been interesting to get to witness a couple waves and then to be able to look back a bit more historically and, and, start to be able to identify the waves that were occurring before I was um, present as well. Is there things that you're seeing out there right now, Avery, that really excite you um, about, about the industry? And it could be from a design perspective, from a consuming uh, perspective. Um, what, what excites you right now about what's out there or what's coming maybe that you're seeing maybe just over the horizon? Yeah. I think that one of the things that has, become really clear to me in the last few years is that there are there are a lot of different avenues to like getting your work out there as a game designer um i started designing at a time and in a particular community where there's a really big emphasis on like you should do it yourself it should be creator owned you should control your artistic work you should get to make these choices it's not hard you don't need to break the bank you don't need to take out a mortgage like print on demand technology exists there are there are cost effective ways to do this but you should you should diy it so that you own it and it's yours um and that is still the way that i produce almost all of my work um and i think that at the time it was a reaction to the fact that um it was that or um freelance uh, and when you freelanced, you made two to three cents per word 
and the the publishers were not trustworthy. Um, and so those were kind of like the two options for you. Um, yeah. And now what I'm seeing is like with Patreon and itch.io and the digital tools that like a wider uh, variety of people have access to, it's really easy to to DIY it on on kind of on any scale, right? On creating a three page game that 47 people check out to doing, you know, large print runs and like working with distributors like that's it's all possible to do that DIY. But I also see interesting things like Evil Hat Games has worked with a variety of designers um, to put out their work. Um, Blades in the Dark was published in that way. Um, April Walsh's game Thirsty Sword Lesbians is being released in that way. Um, uh, Jamila's game Apocalypse Keys, uh, which is like a Hellboy BPRD um, based game, is is being released through Evil Hat. And they seem to have this like really new model of like, you, you are the designer. What we are bringing to the table is like an editing team, uh, resources and capital, um, you know, like all, all of these like tools and supports that you wouldn't have if you were doing this alone. But we're not like trying to like own your words and we're not trying to like take them from you. Um, and so there's 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 kind of new modes that I'm seeing of like publishing collaboration um, and so it just feels like what is really great about right now is that there are, um, just like so many different options on the table for like, h- how do you want to be putting your game design work into the world? Um, I don't think they're all necessarily like financially viable. If you want to be a career designer, I think that there, there's still a real limited, uh, narrow range of what you can do to to make it in terms of like making a, a self-sustaining career out of it but in terms of like you want to be designing games putting them out there getting paid for your work on some level like there's just there's an amazing breadth of options i i completely agree and i'd be curious avery when you think about it so you know to, to put a big category let's let, let's and this is problematic, but I'm going to uh, kind of categorize it anyway, because it helps with my next question. Uh, the, the big tent of geek hobbies, right? Whether it be comic books, whether it be uh, tabletop role playing, tabletop miniatures, um, you know, all of those things. I mean, all have grown and and are more popular now than I think they were before. But it seems to be to me that that there's been a more exponential growth to role playing specifically. Um, versus the others. And I, I wonder whether you have a sense of a, a, if you agree with that or, and if you do or don't be why that is, why do you think it's been different for role playing? Yeah. I mean, I think based on sales data um, that is publicly released, I'm pretty sure that it is just quantitatively correct that role playing games are, are selling more. And then we can assume as a result of that being played more. But I think one of the other things that's occurring is that we've also seen the birth of uh, streaming and we've seen the birth of people playing games visibly things, obviously things like critical role, um, but also smaller games and smaller um, channels. And so uh, we've seen in podcast, in video, um, uh, different ways that people are suddenly making their play more publicly visible um, yeah. which has been interesting for me to experience because what I have I loved about role-playing games is that they are not performed for an audience. They are something you do together that is ephemeral, that is gone once you're done it. Um, and that's, that's not always true anymore. Now, role-playing games are often performances um, that are done for an audience, that are done for money sometimes. and. Mm-hmm. Um, And so, yeah, that's been an interesting twist. But I think one of the things that's happened is while role-playing games are getting more popular, simultaneously, role-playing game play is becoming a lot more visible through podcasts and through streaming. And so we're kind of seeing this like uh, this double expansion of exposure, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the fact that, Avery, that you talk a little bit about what's problematic about actual plays as well. Um, cause I think that that's true too. Cause that is definitely one of the things that I notice is like, I can watch people play role-playing games when, when I was playing role-playing games, it was like the secret code. Like, do you play D and D? So I said, why let's go play D and D. Um, it wasn't something that you just kind of did out in front of everybody. Um, 
But, you know, it makes me think about your comment about Twilight. At the same time, when I played role playing games in high school, it was just me and my buddies around the table. And when we got done, we got done. And, you know, nobody could go back and pick apart and, you know, tear into something that may have been said or done on that where that's not the case with actual plays. Those are permanent. Um, And uh, do you think that that's changing role playing because that's possible um, or creating problems? So I don't think it's limiting it. I do think it is having an impact. Um, I think that there, I don't necessarily know that the average person who both plays role-playing games and takes in actual plays has developed a complete consciousness around the idea that like what we see done for the camera is different than what we do at home. And that's, that's something that like with, with anything, right? Like with reality TV, with, watching pro wrestlers right like it does, <laughs> yeah. with, with so many things like uh we need to develop that like media literacy where we can recognize that like this on-screen activity is not the same as what we do at home even if they're using the same rule set and it's closer maybe in the case of of streamed role-playing games um and i know that for me like some of the most um impactful role-playing games that I've ever played that have had that have like caused me to think about myself differently or think about the world differently that have been really powerful whether they were like like that on purpose or they were like we're goblin adventurers and whoops we just happened to like hit something really poignant and now we're all reflecting accidentally um like either way like though there's a level of vulnerability and trust yeah um and also like permission to explore and experiment in in I guess a safe space is the best word for that, that the, like, I wouldn't have had that same learning and growth and vulnerability. I wouldn't have gone there if it had been, you know, like somewhere between two and 2000 people are watching this as it happens. Right. Um, yeah. And maybe some people are, um, more confident than I am. I mentioned earlier, my natural reaction to almost anything is embarrassment. And so maybe other people don't have that same, um, shift in how they play when something is is on air but i know for me like it really impacts where i want stories to go well just by the nature an observer always changes the situation i to get you know ethereal about the whole thing um but it's something that i have just started thinking about um and a lot of the ideas that you talked about is something that i've been noodling on so that was helpful is there anything that concerns you about what's happening now or um things that are happening that um that that maybe scare is not the right word maybe concern is the right word mostly not mostly i think that they're that it that is great that games are being played in new ways that people get to engage with games in new ways i think the one thing um the one worry i have i guess since you're asking is that like if if a channel gets really popular it's going to have a really big audience uh when it has a really big audience that means a lot of people are going to assume that the way one plays role playing games mm. is uh, the way that it's shown on that channel. And if that channel has a big audience, they're probably like getting money when they make those episodes. And in order to maximize money, you want to make sure that you cut down on dead air or uninteresting TV and things that probably make for uninteresting TV are a lot of the prep work where you build trust, where you talk about safety tools, where you figure out like, what vibe are we wanting to go for? Because that stuff just, it, it it doesn't make for good television. Spitballing where you like toss out a bunch of ideas and then like decide not to follow through on 90% of them doesn't make for good TV. Um, and so uh, I guess, yeah, that would, that would be the worry is that people coming into role-playing games see these people who are just diving into like high intensity, um, conflict laden stories without doing the setup work that builds the trust that makes the table functional. Like that's definitely happening, I'm sure, but it's happening off camera. But you have that next phase of danger, right? So it's one thing to say that it is happening, but they don't have the visibility to it. But then there's a a next generation of that where people go, well, I didn't see it happening, so we're not going to do that. And that could create a terrible situation, right? Totally. And and we talked earlier about how safety tools and kind of the, the ability to build that trust at the table and regulate and uh, restore that trust to the table. Like we've developed so many interesting tools for that over the last decade or so, I would say in particular. Yeah. Um, 
if those don't make it on the air, we start to lose them again. Yeah, that's that is that's very, very interesting. Well, Avery, I can't thank you enough. Um, this was a fantastic conversation um, for those people that want to get more of you and what you do. Um, what is a good resource? Yeah, so I publish all of my work uh, under Buried Without Ceremony. So buriedwithoutceremony.com. That's where you can find my games. Uh, Monster Hearts, The Quiet Year, Dream Askew, Rip and Drive, all of the ones that we talked about today and that we didn't. Um, it's also where you can join the Goblin Friendship Club, which is my Patreon-esque seasonal kind of like newsletter. I share gifts with the Goblin Friendship community. Um, and it's also where you can find links to talks and workshops that I've done. I try to, anytime I get invited to go somewhere and present, I try and turn that into a resource as best I can for the future. And so um, if you're interested to kind of pick apart various design ideas, there's some links there. Um, and then I'm on Twitter. Um, at lacking ceremony um which is both my personal and professional it's like that uh complicated muddy mix um <laughs> but yeah lacking ceremony on twitter excellent i will have links to all of that in the show notes i will warn you um and i and this is your fault avery i lost about an hour of my life getting lost in your website <laughs> there's a lot of stuff there and it was very very fascinating so that's my warning to everybody that uh, you want to set some time aside because you're it's not a website that you're just going to gloss over um so thanks avery i appreciate you coming on yeah thanks so much for having me and for those of you that listen to the end thanks for listening take care we hope you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to Tabletop Talk and share it with your friends. Check out our content on YouTube and Twitch. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook and stay updated on everything coming from Third Floor. All the links are in the show notes. Take care, floorheads. Wow, that collaboration thing is amazing to me. Um, I don't think I completely understood how that all came together. That had to have been amazing, an amazing experience. It was really cool. And the fact that it, start, it started in such a casual way yeah. made it like kind of a bit of a, like a slow burn that I didn't expect yeah. to uh, have that power. I'm going to um, share with you a link that you may want to put it in your show notes. It's to a, an yep. hour-long talk I did at a game design conference called um, Practice, which is a, a kind of an industry conference that's really focused on like the minutia of game design. Um, there's there's a lot of game design conferences that are like big picture uh, stuff, like PowerPoints with just like one word where you say innovation, and this one's like, no, we want you to take like the smallest, most granular design thing you can and talk about it. At length. Fascinating. So. All right. I have got that in my notes right now. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> All right. And let me save it because I'm an idiot. There we go. Saved. Hey, are you still here? Look, uh, the podcast is over. And you sat through all of the breaks and bloopers? Well, I mean, if you're here, you might as well run over to patreon.com and become a supporter. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast, too, while you're at it, on whatever platform you're listening to. I do appreciate you sticking around. Take care. <laughs>